Pray with me. Lord, open our hearts that we may hear well this day. Through Jesus, amen. You may be seated. So my introduction to the sermon is being pushed back all the way to a video that we will show at the piece. So that's unusual, but that's how we're doing it today. Now in the parable of the sower, hear this, an invitation and a caution. Now the invitation is to be about the business of sowing like Jesus himself. But the invitation is also to hear well. Now, we know that large crowds flocked to Jesus wherever he went. In fact, the size of the crowds made it difficult for him to teach. The Sermon on the Mount earlier in Matthew lets us know that Jesus went up on a mountainside to get away from those pressing crowds. I guess he hadn't thought to hire bodyguards yet. Here, Jesus had to get in a boat while the crowd stood on the beach, and Jesus began to sow seed. Wait, you say? <laughs> you mean he began to speak words? God's words, God's word about the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus is actually enacting the parable of which he speaks. See, Jesus is the sower of the word of God. Now, each of the three Gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, position this parable as the lead-off parable in a whole series of parables that frame Jesus' teaching. The sower is distinctive among parables in that each Gospel records how Jesus' private interpretation of this parable to his followers comes afterwards rather than to the whole crowds. No other parable gets this kind of treatment, so you have to ask why. Well, keep that in mind, in the back of your mind, as we go along. Once, there was a sower who scattered seed. We are meant to understand that Jesus is at that very moment acting as the sower, broadcasting the word of the kingdom to this mixed crowd of hearers. And this sower of the word is not part of the establishment. He does not belong to the historic curated group of the religious priestly caste or even to the scribes overseeing the civil law for Jews. Jesus did, however, seem to successfully sit, fit in as a rabbi overseeing the education, or shall I say catechesis, of the people who heard and followed him. Jesus continued. This sower walked in a field scattering seeds as he went, and he noticed that some seeds fell beside a road. The ever-present birds of the field spied that seed and swooped down to gobble up the seed. Now, because after all, the seed lay on dry and crusty ground with zero chance of lasting long enough to be covered by dirt at any later opportunity. The schemes of Satan to discourage, to distract, and to gobble up every bit of God's word, that's a given. Expect it. But the sower kept going because he or she was doing what they were called to do, which is broadcast the seed to as many as possible and as broadly as possible. See, the sower was not worried about running out of seed. I mean, you never run out of the word of God, right? <laughs> no need to be stingy, careful, or even, it seems, discerning. So even when they know that the seed would fall on hard and trampled ground, the sower sows anyway, regardless Jesus is saying that some will physically hear the word of God, but not understand it. The understanding has been snatched away by an enemy who wants to keep us hostile and unsubmissive to God's law. This is the truth that we heard in Romans 8, 
verses 7 and 8. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. See, the image of hard and trampled ground, well, it's fitting. The sower kept going and noticed that some seeds fell among shallow soil filled with rocks. Now, from experience, the sower knows that the seed can quickly break open and put down some roots into the ground, but those roots would keep hitting stones instead of rich earth. And then when the sun sapped away its water, the roots proved to be unable to withstand the hardships. So those plants withered. Sure, they might have looked good in the beginning, but what good is that after many days? I can safely say that this is one reason that emotional or manipulative preaching and singing at camps or retreats, well, that can be a little bit of a danger here. But did that stop the sower from broadcasting the seed among the rocks? Again, no. But the same problems of the hard trampled ground persist. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. And this hostility looks like one who hears the word and receives it with joy, but can't endure real life. So of course, the sower is still casting seed. And notice that some seed fell among thorny vines. Well, finally, the chance that these roots could go a little bit deeper. Maybe, just maybe, the seed could be fruitful. But the reality is that the thorns were too well established. This thorny vine was a hardy type. That's pretty usual for weeds, am I right? I have a very obnoxious weed we cannot get rid of. And that sower, ever an optimist, kept sowing and scattering the seed until finally the rich soil proved the point that the prophet Isaiah makes in our reading today. And we will be looking at Isaiah chapter 55. So if you want to pull out a Bible or your Bible app, We'll be looking at that today. For as, this is verse 10, for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, make it, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. See, the sower is intrepid, keeps working, keeps hoping that the seed being scattered will bear fruit. And this time, it looks like that is what is going to happen. The seed produces more seed, which becomes seed to the sower and bread to the eater. The rains and the snow sent from heaven water the, watering the earth, enabling the seed to do what it was made to do, which is create a plant that will eventually bear leaves and fruit and reproduce more seed. <clears throat> the sower in this parable is not responsible for success, but only for sowing. The sower does not prejudge the soil, the soil's potential before casting the seed. See, the sower knows that the one who sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. That's 2 Corinthians 9, 6. So even though the sowing is, will not meet with this universal success, no farmer refrains from scattering the seed out of fear that some might be wasted. See, success comes from God. See, Paul tells us this in his first letter to the Corinthians that he planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. 
<clears throat> Jesus used parables to present his worldview that calls listeners to all, of all walks of life, everyday people, like the people his, who first heard it and the people like you and me. And the task is to reconsider our life priorities in light of Jesus' reign, then and now. Jesus is focused on broadcasting the kingdom announcement to all within hearing. But he is also tilling the lives of those listeners, responding with obedient faith. Now, at this point, Jesus is in conflict with Jewish religious and civil authorities only when they attempt to spread, when they attempt to prevent the spread or broadcast of his kingdom announcement. There is more clash later on. And as for us, it's easy to think that the path, the rocks, the thorns, well, they represent other people. We like to think well of ourselves. It's really human nature. <clears throat> but what if it's true of us today? Us. I mean, there were religious people in that crowd who were not increasing 30 and 60 and 100 fold. That's a guarantee. So here's the word of caution that comes in verse 9. The one who has ears to hear, let them hear. See, we find out why Jesus speaks in parables. He is the sower, and some of the seed is falling on pathy, rocky, and thorny soil, and it's on purpose. The disciples have enough sense to ask Jesus for an interpretation, and then that's when Jesus tells them that the knowledge of the secrets of heaven, well, it's been given to them. How is it, you say? They can ask Jesus directly. He lets them know what he teaches in the parable so that people may look but not see, that they will listen but not hear or understand. See, Isaiah had prophesied this terrible tragedy, but also gave hope that if they, even in their blindness, even in their deafness, so choose, then Jesus would heal them. Because as Christians, we are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Because the Spirit of God dwells in us and he is giving life to our mortal bodies through the Spirit who dwells in us. That's our Romans passage today. But that doesn't necessarily mean that our soil is producing 30 and 60 or 100 fold. So the personal and challenging questions for us this morning are this. When does Jesus sow the word in your life? When does he sow? And what do you do with that seed? Remember that it is God who makes us grow. But our responsibility is to cultivate the soil of our lives. Our responsibility is to hear well. So picture Jesus standing on a boat and saying to you, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You are thirsty, and the water you normally drink from, it's not satisfying to you. You're still thirsty. A sower went out to cast seed, and some of the seed fell along the path. But come to me, you who has no money, come by and eat. Sometimes the seed falls along the hard and trampled down parts of your life, but don't let it. Come by wine and milk without money and without price. The ways of the world and the heavy burdens of the world say that you need to buy your own way to provide for yourself with much striving. 
and pushing, but not with me, your provider of wine and milk without the loss of your own wages. I will shoulder the cost of your thirst. I paid the cost of your healing by my sacrifice on the cross. You might feel ashamed, but come, because I have a question for you. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that, that which does not satisfy? Trouble and persecution and dangers may await you if you follow me. But first, let me move the rocks out of the way in your heart. Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Others may have told you that following me and allowing me to change your life means that all fun is gone. To the contrary, the joy of following means the very best, the riches of food and wine. <clears throat> it will satisfy your soul in a way that nothing else ever will or ever could. Sure, the cares and the thorns of the world, they're still there. But my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. The way the world reasons things out <clears throat> might, might make sense to you, but my ways are even higher than the earth. So are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The one who has ears to hear, let them hear. Do you hear Jesus? Amen. Amen.